what explains the poor career prospects of women in financial services and the boardroom in general? I work in a bank. I'm not yes. a banker. I My background that. is not banking. Okay. At all. Yes, I know. So I'm a yeah, divisional the head, but yeah, I'm yeah. coming from FMCG, media ah, and okay. entertainment. That's my background. Okay. I'm telco. Okay. So um, there is, in I think, there's a reason why I work in Diamond Bank. The four directors um, in Diamond Bank, two are women, okay. two are men. Okay. So it's a 50% split. That's okay. the first thing. And when you walk into the board and you I had to be interviewed by the board of directors, you had uh, two senior women sitting down on that board who had to interview me. And these are non-executive directors at the time. Yeah. So I think it's a deliberate attempt by Uzoma and yeah. our chairman at that time and to continue to do that, to actually push to have um, parity and yeah. uh, a more equi equitable representation on the board. Now, financial institutions, you find that the way banks have classically built up is long hours, yeah. crazy work schedules, non, there is no flexibility in time. Yeah. A woman is either a, a mother, a daughter, a sister. She has a lot of responsibilities as well as work. So you find that quite a number of women, not that um, they're not ambitious, but either their own personal challenges of just trying to deal with life as it is, as well as work, does not allow them put in this sometimes crazy hours that may require them to now say, okay, if you put in these hours, that's how you get promoted. Yeah. If you give, it's not that they're not delivering. Yeah. They are, but I'm not able to work Monday to Sunday. I'm not able to stay in the office till 11. I have a husband who also works, who wants me to come home, or a father who is looking out the door saying, why hasn't this girl come, and so on and yeah. so forth. So there, and this was before, I don't think it's how it is now, slowly but surely. And that is because the one or two voices that have moved up, and I'll look at the banking industry, and look at the various heads of corporate communications. A lot of us are women. Are women. True. A lot of us are women now. You actually have quite a few women in Treasury, international operations, sitting up at the top at ED level, at GM level. I think the onus now is on them, as myself, to speak up, to encourage, to push the system and the policies to allow for more flexibility yeah. so that you have these women come up. Because it's not that they're not put, pulling their weight, they are, but there are certain things they may not be able to do. And to be honest, Uzama was here earlier talking about technology. Technology allows you to work, not necessarily sitting in one place in the office. Yeah. I'm on call 24 seven. I can be on the phone with Uzama at any point in time. I can be on Skype, I can you know, be on my laptop. I will deliver. I don't have to be in the office at sun, on Sunday at 7 p.m. So those are some of the things that I think are being considered now. And when you look at it, when you come to interview, there are some of the opportunities there for you. So, Omotala, we recently heard that you are the UN ambassador to the, for the, the UN SDG ambassador. I hope I'm correct. Um, can you shed more light on what that entails, what is involved, and how, does, how do people either get involved or how does it work? Um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so the UN SDG is actually is um, the Sustainable Development Goals, and there are 17 of them. And um, basically, there was before that there was the NDGs and stuff, and it wasn't um, really successful. And now the SDGs, the SDGs, um, we hope that by year 2020 20 or 24, I'm not very sure that um, virtually every country in the world would have um, activated, not just activated, but at least actualized um, them. And they are, like I said, there are 17. I can't reel all of them. I, yeah. I um, do um, number one, which is no poverty. Um, yeah. I'm sure if you have something there, you can, or if you want me to, but you can check it up. Um, there are 17, and it's also very important for you to find the one, because really everybody uh, cannot identify with every one of them. There are some underwater, there are some that I think don't even right now apply to Africa, or they are not really our biggest problems. Um, there's, there's some on oceanary, there, even though we do have waterways and all of that stuff, but there are some that right now are even more important. For example, the no poverty and so many other ones. So find the one that really um, um, resonates with you, and then um, in your own way, whatever capacity you are in, try the best you can to, um, to follow it up and then work on it. Okay, so you mentioned poverty. Which is, is that your focus? Well, yeah. that's the one I, yeah, as a person, yeah. have okay, identified Okay, that's the one with. you associate yeah. yourself with. So, um, in speaking about poverty, can you tell us ways we can eradicate um, poverty with women empowerment? 
So what is women empowerment? Um, also, well, I wear plenty of hats, if you, if you permit me. I work also with um, um, the UN when it, uh, with women okay. um, and, and stuff. And I remember even one, when they first came, mm -hmm. um, there was all this talk about um, equality. equality and stuff. Yeah. And um, that was the first thing they wanted to um, take on when they came here. Yeah. And I remember I had this meeting with the whole team and they luckily wanted my opinion and um, cherished it. And I told them, I said, it's not time for that now here. Um, I, don't, I know that men and women um, having parity when it comes to um, payments and stuff is, is a worldwide problem. But I don't think that's our biggest problem in Africa, at least okay. not in the creative industry. Okay. Um, right now, I know that empowerment and mutual respect is our problem. And so when you talk about empowerment, you have to define what empowerment actually means. means because yeah. it's very easy to just say, oh, female empowerment, women empowerment, and everybody just gets on with it. And the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh, give them work, give them money. That's not just what we're talking about here. Okay. Um, everything else is encapsulated in that. Okay. When you talk about female or women empowerment, um, which I don't really like as a term, because for me, I'm sure a lot of you know I'm already, most of you know I'm an activist. And so the first thing is my brain goes into, into rebel mode. Right. Like, okay, so I'm asking okay. you for handouts for you to, you know, that's not what I want. I want mutual respect. Okay. Um, I saw on somebody's um, um, Instagram yesterday for the International Women's Day, and she said, how about not respect me because I'm a woman or your mother or your sister? Or whatever? How about you, you just respect me because I'm, I'm a human? Because I'm a human being. How about yeah. that? And that's a higher level to think. Yeah. Don't, don't respect me because I can do this for you. Mm, no, respect me because I'm a human being mm. and I deserve to be respected. So I, I say to you that when you talk about female or women empowerment, yeah. pretty much what I think we should be talking about is the human respect as another human being that is working like you. Okay. Okay. How about you give me that respect? That I might, I don't, I, like I said, I don't believe in, um, um, what's the word we were saying again the other time? Equality. Equality. Because who says I want to be equal with you? How about okay. I want to be bigger than you? Good. So when I say I want to be equal with men, I feel like I'm already cheating myself. Because hello, if I'm more intelligent than you, mm. I want to be higher than you. Okay. okay. So respect so me for what I bring to the table. UND. Mm -hmm. Maybe we would not just have International Women's Day, but basically an International Respect Human Beings Day. That could work. <laughs> <laughs> if we can do that, what are the potentials we have to improve economic mobility for Nigerian women in the industry? For me, honestly, I think following in Omotola's footsteps, I don't look at things from the gender perspective. What I try to do as a human being is to add value. And I think that's what all of us need to be focusing on. You know, because at the end of the day, we're all humans. And what we need to do in this nation is to provide more jobs for the younger generation and to ensure that whatever it is that we do, we add value. And the way most people have been able to achieve this is by looking at the environment and asking themselves, what is missing? What needs to be done? Each and every one of us, every day we get up, there is always something that hurts, something that we feel needs to be fixed. So there was a video flying around recently where they showed um, the story of all those who are billionaires and those who have made impact um, on mankind in the recent years. Yeah. And every single one of them, all they did was just to look at the gap in the society and fill that gap. If you look at Bill Gates, what he's doing now with the treatment of malaria and also power. When he finds that solution, they say, everybody will say he was lucky. But in reality, he's trying to fix a problem that he sees exists. And the same goes for Zuckerberg. All he did was he created a socialization platform. Now today, he's a billionaire from it. And the same goes for Steve Jobs. And the same goes for every single person that you talk about today that has become something. So in our situation, all that we did was we looked at the Nigerian space and asked ourselves, how come we don't have cultural centers? And today, I mean, there are, billion, there are billionaires in Nigeria, billionaires who can build 100 theaters. Mm -hmm. None have deemed it fit or appropriate to do so. We built this with our little cobbles. And it is driving so many other things, the quality of theater, the quality of presentations, little bits and pieces here and there. And invariably, you'll be able to add to your 
bottom line. That's the reality of life. So if I were you, whether you're a woman or a man, what you can do for yourself is to ask yourself, what challenges do you face on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. And how can you feel? I can use very simple examples, even Omotola sitting here. The truth of the matter is, acting at a point in time in Nigeria wasn't sexy or glamorous. But they saw the need. They saw that there was a gap. They saw that pretty good-looking actresses were not in existence in Nigeria or they were not particularly renowned or celebrated. And they went into that space. Now, these are superstars. And they're younger. There are loads of you here that can do the exact same thing if you choose to go into acting. You know, so all you need to do is look at your space and ask yourself, what can I be doing that can create that difference? And if you create that difference or if you bridge that gap, you'll be able to to add to your own bottom line. That's, I don't know if I, yeah. I answered uh, yeah, I question. Yeah, you, I think you've covered that. I think even also going back to you now, and I, you know you have spoken about acting, but we realize that in the industry, there's much more to it than just being on the stage. And you have taken advantage of that, being behind the camera, directing 93 Days. And I'm sure we'll be expecting more coming from BAP production. But I know, again, we are not talking only gender, um, women, um, empowerment. We're not just focusing on one gender. But how can people take advantage of the other sectors? So we know, yes, there are other aspects but we know we see women focusing okay if i can't do if i can't act maybe i'll do costuming and then i'll do makeup and that's it but we know it goes deeper than that there's stage management there's the, the build there's there's more to it how can women or men take advantage of this um okay again it's a question of looking at the industry and asking yourself where do you fit or where do you see a lack so when we started theater at terror culture in fact Theater was already sort of like comatose in Nigeria. Yeah. So we opened the space up. Then it was a small cabin. <laughs> we opened it up for free to people for seven years, OK? So all actors, dancers, what have you, will come here, and we won't charge them a dime. Now, a lot of the people that you see, the younger in their early 30s, late 20s in Nollywood now, a lot of them started from here. This is um, less than 10 years of history. Uh, what we did then was we allowed people to just come showcase their abilities. And from there, you found out that a lot of talent was there just sitting at home for, without, because they didn't have the, the space to come and the platform to exhibit their wares. And in the course of doing this, now, our lighting department, when we started here, we didn't have this. Now we have a lighting team that is composed of maybe almost 10 people that they're employing today. It was a one-man act before. So you have young people now going into lighting, there is the costuming. Costuming was a zero, zero industry. If we show you the massive costume room that we have here at Terraculture, it's almost like a full floor. So we have people now in that department. At every production, you have close to 10 people in costuming that are working. And we have our own full-time staff who are engaged in creating costume on a daily basis for every production. So that is an opportunity there for you. You could actually even do costume rentals. That is something that you could do. Again, sound. Sound was something that was not particularly, you know, it, it wasn't well developed. People were still struggling. But now, even in this theater alone, we have a team of sound engineers. And for each production, you have close to about eight, nine people in sound. Those that are fixing the mics behind the stage, those that are manning it over there, etc. And then, of course, there's projection. Now we have animators that have started coming out. People are creating incredible, incredible stuff. When we first started, the images were always static. Now you have people creating fun things, people coming up with different ideas. And it's unbelievable that I asked myself a couple of months, years ago, this just wasn't in existence. And the amount of creativity that Nigerians have is incredible. Then stage management, like you rightly pointed out. There's stage management. There's even those who are just welfare managers. All they do is they see to the cast and make sure that food is served. So there's a catering department. There's so much that goes on. Obviously, there's a makeup. There's a makeup. Some of you can specialize in makeup, stage makeup, and movie makeup, as well as hair. The movie industry, I mean, she knows as much as I do. There's so much going on there. I didn't direct 93 Days. I was a co-producer. But be that as it may, we have another movie coming out soon, and it's amazing the amount of jobs that you can create 
when you do a movie. So we keep telling government, we keep telling people that the creative industry actually has the potential to create the most jobs in Nigeria, as opposed to the oil industry, because the creative industry engages so many youths at different skill levels. So it's not, you don't have to be a PhD holder. You can find something that will meet your um, abilities at every level of the creative industry. So this is an area that if I were to suggest, a lot of you might want to look at, and you'll become your own boss. And the beauty of it is that you generate cash on a daily basis with those kind of jobs. So that is, that is an opportunity there that is um, waiting to be taken. So I hope, I hope that helps. I think another thing we should look at is expertise. These jobs are there, but we don't have the expertise for it. However, you can become the expert. Go on YouTube, Google, look through these things. For makeup, for example, when Tara Fela Durote started and Banke Mashida, there was really nothing like the makeup industry. But they developed the skills on their own. They didn't go to makeup school. It was later on, you know, as everything developed, you know, the business developed globally. They went to makeup school. So you can be the pioneer of some of the things she's talking about. I'm sure for the, the stage, even, you know, I mean, I'm talking about fashion now, for example. I was going to go into what she said, but let me talk about fashion. In the fashion business, we have pattern cutters. Now, we have designers. Everybody's a designer. Do you know that? In the, in the fashion industry, there are pattern cutters, there are designers as well, there are buyers, there are merchandisers, there are marketers, there are PR for fashion. All these, these, um, these roles have different expertise, but here it's one fashion designer doing everything. We also have retailers, there are people that specialize in fashion retailing. There are people that, fashion, that, that, um, that um, focus on visual merchandising. So when you want to open a chain of stores, they are the ones that do the fittings and make sure that your store looks the same in different places and you have a brand. So you can Google, you can go through these things and become that one person that starts this thing in Nigeria. Why not? We don't have that now. So these are ways we can you know, create jobs for ourselves. It may be hard at first, but then you can do it. It's my two cents. Amatala, do you still want to add? She pretty much read my mind. I was going to talk on that, but maybe in a little, you know, different way. I'm not talking about being a pioneer because virtually everything that we've talked about, someone is already doing it. I think the problem is always standing out. And this is what I always try to talk to young people about. You can do the same thing one million people are doing, but you will stand out. And what makes you stand out? The test to, to stand out. First and foremost, you must have a passion for what you do. Don't go do it just because it is another thing you think you can do. Because truthfully, I believe a lot of us can do so many things. I really do. I believe we don't do so many things because we are afraid. So what are you passionate about? Um, like, you know, Mrs. Um, Austin Peters talked about the different departments, for example, in movie making. I've been, I've been preaching this for years. A lot of people don't even know that there are people that should be agents. Why do you even have to be in, you know, like, I need an agent. Do you know how much money you will make? be my agent, but you want to be the actor. But you don't even have the face to be the actor. Can we be real? You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, why don't you go into a department where you will shine? And then to now add what Omomi said to that, go and, um, and get whatever it is that you need to get, whether it is going to school, the expertise, going to school, or going to learn it on the internet. For example, I didn't go to acting school. Virtually everything I have learned on the job, I learned by watching other people, by going to do my research. But first and foremost, I had the thirst to be outstanding. And I will not make, I, I, I'm not shy to say that. I'm a very thirsty person when it comes to my job. I am vicious. So for us, I think at the point where we are right now, because we're talking about, I don't want us to digress from the topic. We're talking about the 21st century. All right? We're well, talking about the 21st century. For you to make it in the 21st century, it is not a joke. There's competition out there. Your competition is not in Nigeria. Your competition is worldwide. So you need to break out of the Nigerian mentality. Check out your competition and get up and work for it. Oh, my God. Thank you very much. I would love to say preach <laughs> right now. But I think one thing every woman here has emphasized on is the fact that you don't need to be put in a box. Do you 
Research is key from everything everyone has mentioned here. Um, before we started, Omotala, I had mentioned that most people look to the creative industry to try and correct bias, um, also help with things that go wrong. Now, on the Me Too movement on sexual abuse, more women in technology, more women in governance. Why is this important that we have the conversation today? That's on Me Too. Moment, yes. <laughs> okay, so the Me Too movement is, is about um, sexual harassment, no? Yes, it is. Um, so are we talking Nigeria or are we talking global? So the Me Too is the Nigerian, the global. enough... It's the, the global, global yes. Yeah. Okay, so are you, are, you, are you asking this question in terms of this country? In or terms of the Nigeria, yes. In terms so of Me Too is, the, um, is a um, sexual abuse um, movement, calling out people who yeah. abuse um, women, especially in the creative industry. But then mm. they opened it up and then made it about everybody else. It doesn't even have to be this, the mm. creative industry anymore. Mm. Um, so I think if I bring that back to Nigeria, um, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I try to be politically correct when I'm in places like this, but I don't know. I, the, the over two full person me will just start coming no, up. Let's, let's be real. I personally don't think in this country we have that problem. Okay. And it's tongue in cheek. Yes, I really don't think so. As especially in the entertainment industry. Okay. Because I can't speak for every industry because I'm not in every industry. Yeah. But I think the Nigerian woman is very bold. Yeah. I really do think yeah. so. And I think Luckily for us, um, I'm going to quickly go back a little bit, back to when I talked about one. And when they came out, we're talking about the gender equality and all of that stuff. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I don't think that in the ent entertainment industry, the, the female has a problem. We don't. Okay. I mean, you know, there are There'll little problems those, here and yeah. there. But we, look at Mrs. Austin Peters. Yeah. Do you know any other male that is doing what she's doing? No. No, I'm, I'm, do you know any other male that is doing what she's doing? No. In the space in which that she's doing she's it? Doing, no. Do you know anybody else that is doing what Muabudu is doing in the space that she's doing it? Okay, do you know anybody who's doing what Amatala is doing in the space that she's doing it? <laughs> Hello. No, so what I'm trying to say is this. The women have the upper hand in the entertainment industry and we really can have the upper hand in every other industry. Yeah. It is possible. A lot of women have proven that it is possible. True. It now depends on us. I don't like being a victim. And I don't want to be insensitive that there are people that are probably going through that, but that's now for someone else to discuss. Yeah. I don't discuss those kind of, and I may be hard, mm -hmm. but that's just the way my brain works. <laughs> I don't condone victim mentality, especially when I know that you can decide not, not to, be to be a victim. victim. There are way too many options. If you are a female in this industry, and a man is trying to take you down or whatever, there are so many options. So many beautiful women are doing great things. Do you know how many female producers we have in oh, Nollywood? Way number. more than the male, yeah. male, male. In this industry, women, I might, if I'm wrong, please, you can, you can tackle me. Mm. The females make more money than the guys. True. The That's female true. actors make more money than the male actors in this industry. And for the longest time, true. for the longest time, so I don't think that is our problem. Now, I'm, like I said, I don't, I'm not in other industries, so I can't speak for all of them. Okay. You, you can speak for the fashion industry and everything. Yeah. But my point is this. The possibility is there for you as a Nigerian woman. And I think also because as Nigerian women or as African women, yeah. we have an advantage that our men don't have. Please forgive me, men. I'm not attacking you. I'm just trying to speak for my women here. Yeah. It's International Women's Day. Yes, um, it is. So... We, we have an advantage that men don't have. Haven't, um, like she said earlier, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, um, Chuma, Chuma. Miss Chuma. you know, like she said earlier when I came in, that was what she was talking about. She was talking about women facing so many things like, you know, um, your husband, your father, yeah. your, you know, we all know all these issues and everything, but enough. With all due respect, enough. Because we can. We just can. Yeah. That's our magic. That's our power. We cannot afford to hide behind all of that anymore. There are women that have proven that it can be done. It is your cross. Carry it. And you really can carry it gracefully. And you will do it perfectly. That's why you are special. And that's why you are a woman. I, I just want to add to what she said. I mean, you know, I completely agree. And that's for adults. Um, however, when we talk about International Women's Day... Um, we also talk about the young ones. So, you know, we here, or, you know, adults, um, we as women are able to speak for ourselves. We're able to stand. 
But then the children, the women, the girls that are children, it's a little bit difficult. Um, that's where the Me Too movement comes in. This is very emotional for me yeah. because we have a lot of students now that are getting sexually abused. Yeah. Do you know that five, four out of five women were sexually abused when they were much younger? I was sitting down, let me tell you a short story. You know, I went to Queens College, Yaba, Lagos. I was sitting down with some friends of mine. We were, there were 10 of us and we were just, you know, having a, a sleepover. And it turns out that every single one of us had been sexually abused at some point in our lives. This was not while we were in Queens College. This was before we went into Queens College or when we went home because we, we were in boarding school. So that's where I'm trying to, you know, that's, I'm just trying to push that out. The Me Too movement in Nigeria may be more about the younger women, the younger girls. So is the Me Too movement for children, really? I think it's for people in the um, workplace. So, for example, the models internationally, let me talk about the modeling industry, because I'm in that industry as well. You know, the, um, is it the Jackie, what's her name? The girls that have come out to say that um, Bill Cosby or one Some producer. Of the actors, yeah. Some um, of the actresses. You know, Weinstein. Weinstein you know, sexually abused them. They were young, they were 18. It's just yeah. now they're women and they're able to come out to speak. But when they were much younger, that's when they faced it that. Happened, yeah. So that's where the Me Too. So when I, when I, I'm, I'm um, 30 now and when I was 18, this person sexually abused me. Now I come out, somebody else that is now 30 comes out to say Me Too. Yeah. So that's where, and I think, I think we should try to bring that Me Too movement here really, really, you know, because it's, it's happening and I think it's something we should start speaking about more. So my thing is this, when we bring, do, do we have to call it Me Too? I don't know if I'm the only one who feels this way. Because then again, I, I understand where you're coming from, Omomi, and I'm trying to find that middle ground. And when you're talking about sexual harassment for young girls, now that you break it down, I key into that. It is really true. I have a friend who's doing exactly that. That's a Touch Me Not uh, movement. I don't know if you... Mercy. And like, like what you're saying is very true with younger children. But um, just like I said earlier with the first... Um, um, with the gender equality and the spirits that comes with that, that's what I fight. I, I say to Africans, I understand what this fight are about. How do we make it our own? Peculiar to us, with our own special problems. Now, even though we have international children, or uh, on the international field, where children will say, okay, I was abused by my father, and stuff like that, which happens here as well. You have to understand that most of the problems we deal with here are very different. I'll give you an example. One time, I was driving, and um, a child, you know, if children going to school, around the Keja, and the bus conductor, um, hung out of the bus and slapped her butt. So she's supposed to do me too. No, but you know what I'm trying to say? That's a different kind of yeah. issue that is deeper yeah. than me too. Because it is harassment yeah. as well. It, do you get my point? I, 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 what I, think, saying, right? so, I know what you're saying. You know what I, I want think... to add? Before you speak, Chioma, what I wanted to add is they had transcended from me too to time's up. And time's up sorts of, you know what? We need you to stop. Nigerians as, as a people... It's, um, that's why war against indiscipline worked for us. You have to be action-based. Action, yeah. So where abroad, there's laws and regulations and all these things that can fight it. And so when you speak up, this guy gets removed from the system, rah, rah, rah. Ours is almost cultural, the silence and what we bury. So to your point, that young man who is a conductor, who smacks that girl's butt, saw his father smack one girl when he was growing up. Oh, he was fine. His father did not understand why he wouldn't do that. It's, it's, it's embedded, it's endemic. So ours is more of an uproar than a me too, oh, it happened to me. Because you, you, and, and we also, because it's cultural, you don't find a lot of people wanting to talk about it. Yeah. So a lot of people don't want to you know, sit down and say, hey, this one happened to me. We'll bury it, we'll live with it, it comes out in our behaviors. If our children exhibit those things, we'll try and hide it, and it just keeps on going in a vicious circle. So it, it, ours is actually a bit more, it's a lot deeper. Yeah. And therefore the fight is really wrench it out. And how to wrench it out is a lot more than just, I don't know, standing up and doing what they do, ala me too. So I'm agreeing with what you're saying, I'm actually keen into what Omotala said about the, its action. 
and it's not a me too, it's a time out, it's a stop. It's, it's the advocacy, your friend who we called, I have one, Kemi Da Silva Ibru, who yeah. is, who's got an NGO on that as well, Warif, and that's what all of them are talking about. And they keep on saying to me, Choma, Kemi said to me, Choma, it's not in Agegeu, no, 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 it's not in Mushi, it's in Ikoi. Yeah. So it's all over the place where women, girls, even young men. And so the education, and that's another thing that we're trying to do, education. So yeah. education is not about just telling the girl, because a lot of it is girl, child, girl, child. So back to what you said about it's not, man, it's not woman only, it's man and woman. It's actually going to the schools and helping those young boys in public schools understand yeah. that's it. That's it. That's that this is not the right behavior. Yeah. There are male examples of excellence. So when we, like, my, my business supports Warif, for instance. And so when we go to schools, we're going to, not as just women, but our young men in the bank are going as well to say, look, I may be an entry-level staff, yeah. I'm, I have a girlfriend, I have a mom, you know, I'm living a good life. I'm, I'm building myself little by little. I do not bring, this is not behavior that I like. Hitting a woman, um, um, slapping her, raping her, deciding that you want to have you know, um, non-consensual sex with her or whatever, it's not touching her, it's not right. Because these young men live in homes where it's a one bedroom for the ones who are really um, low class. It's a one bedroom, they are seeing their parents um, having sex. They don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, it's normal. So when they come out and they see the next girl and they feel whatever, you know, she's a thing. They've objectified this woman. But when you see strong females, strong men as well, coming to talk to you to say, look, this is who we are, this is where we're coming from. So we're educating from the boys yeah. and the girls in schools, okay. primary schools, secondary schools. It's amazing. I have a 15, I have a fi going to be 16 year old son. I have seven year old do twin daughters. They're talking about sex in, at that level now. That age. Schools yeah. are now having to wake up and help them understand what's good, what's bad. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. And wait, yes, who cannot? So you go that far. But that doesn't happen because we don't have that in curriculum in public schools. So going to yeah. those places and actually letting the boys, not only the girls, know. No. So the girls know push away. The boys know don't go there. Yeah. It's, it's very simple. I, I completely agree. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I completely no agree. Um, you know, with the education and with the, you know, awareness and all of that. However, why I like the Me Too movement is because it's the truth. It's yeah. real. Silence, like you said, silence is what has been happening. Stop. And there's this cultural thing of, oh, I can't talk. It's going to be a shame. It's going to be an embarrassment. As a matter of fact, abroad that they are saying Me Too. In the Western world, it's easier for them because things happen. They're pedophiles and all of that, and the, the gay thing even started there. So with them, they even come out and say, oh, this happened to me. But in Nigeria, it's totally different. To come out and say that you've been sexually um, harassed two years ago or five years ago was a total shame. People may even, no, you may not, ha not have any friends. You know, so I think that's where the Me Too movement comes in. And the, what's that one again? The Time's up. Time's up. Where people are, are strong enough to stand and say, you know what, stand in front of these students, in front of the boys and the girls and say, this happened to me. So that even rings into their ears and they know that, you know what, when I was in school, nobody, in, I went to Queen's College, I never had anybody say I've been sexually harassed. It was a, oh my God, you know, for people to, a teacher or whatever to come and say that this happened to me. So all of that is what is creating the awareness and putting heat on people's bum bum to stop, to stop. harassing. <laughs> Sorry. So I think my initial question even to Amotala then was how can the creative industry get it? And yes, you have made a case for the fact that our own um, cases are quite peculiar. But again, I'm putting it to Bolanle here as well as um, Omotala. How can the creative, because advocacy is one. There's nobody here that doesn't own a TV or watch TV yeah. or listen to radio. And then all these things can now be replicated online as well. How can the creative industry get cashing on, not cashing, sorry, get in, <laughs> wrong with choice of words. How can they get in on this movement and begin to sensitize people on what to do and what not to do? Okay, um, I think if you look at everything that has been said, you know, the point, what, what I take from it is about respect. It's not about the girl child, it's not about the male child, because I think where Omotola is coming from is this, correct me if I'm wrong. There's a tendency for us in Africa to always borrow everything foreign. So the Me Too movement is specific to an industry that started in America and a way of life. It's not the case in our industry here. However, we know that there is some form of sexual deviance, sexual bad manners going on in Nigeria as it is going on everywhere else in the world. 
and it's not specific to the, to the female child, to the girl child. Boys are also being abused. So we have to be very careful when we borrow foreign, you know, these hashtags, you know, the, the ability to influence um, conversations is incredible. So we in Nigeria, we have our own issues. And the truth of the matter is sexual bad manners has been going on for a long time from both sides. Now, what I see with the creative industry, with all industries, is that power is important. And that's what she was saying. And that's why she's saying that for everybody in this room, it's important that you have power. Power to control what you eat, what gets into your body, what you don't want, you don't accept. And typically, when you're in a position of poverty, you are, you are disempowered. And it's important that all of us get to that point where we begin to have economic independence. Because the reason why we don't have that problem, as she pointed out, in the industry right now is because we have a lot of powerful women in powerful positions. And I dare say if she's in a bank and she's the bank MD, she probably will not victimize the boys underneath her and maybe vice versa if there's a decent man at the top. But there's a tendency for us to also vilify ourselves too much and that's why I'm also very hesitant to jump on the bandwagon of people who go come with all these hashtags because I've been at a meeting especially where you have foreigners where they have conversations and they bring out all these statistics. I don't know who gives them these figures because it's a bit bizarre. I have brothers, I have husband, well not husbands, I have a husband. <laughs> I have nephews, I have a son. They're not pedophiles and they're not crazy people. So I don't appreciate it when people go on and on about the fact that it's, it's, it's not, we have to be very careful. Because when you say statistics like four in five, I wasn't abused. And I was at one of these spaces where we're having this conversation where every woman that was not abused refused to talk because they felt that if they spoke, they will be in the minority. And I said, no, 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 no. We have to change this direction because these people are going to leave this room thinking that every Nigerian man is crazy. We're not. We're not any crazier than they are on their own side as well. So please, I'm just very careful about following hashtags. There are problems, the same problems we have here, they have overseas, but every industry has its own peculiar issues. But the important thing about the creative industry is that when we take everything back, bottom line is wherever there is awareness, education, and money, there's less tendency for people to abuse others. So I would focus my energies on us as a people, empowering ourselves, educating ourselves, because what they are doing at Diamond Bank with Warif, essentially, and I told Kemi this, I said, you know, your conversation, having girls talking to girls makes no sense to me. You should be talking to boys about sexual deviance, yes. Because if I have a young boy at home and I don't tell him that it's bad to rape, and I'm talking to all the girls here that they rape me, they rape me, well, what is that conversation? It's useless. The same with mothers, Boy, women who abuse young boys or old men who abuse, it's the same thing. We should be talking to each other. So it's about education. Education, awareness, education, awareness about everything bad, not only sexual. Yes. Poverty is bad. In fact, poverty is the worst crime that anybody can commit. So when you have a country where majority of the people are poor, we're in trouble. That is why you have crimes such as sexual misbehavior going on, simply because People do not have the means to speak out. When you're beholding, I, I'm, I as a young girl, if I go and look for a job, in as much as I can tell you now that no man can victimize me, a young girl who has to probably feed her family, X, Y, Z, gets a man who is asking her to do certain things, will probably do it because she doesn't exactly. That's her only way out of poverty. So the country needs to change. And the reason why the country is not where it is, where it, is, it ought to be, is because for a long time, we forgot creativity. For a long time, our country stopped thinking. Everybody was dependent on oil. And oil because oil is brain dead. It's something that we don't work for, and we got used to not working for things. So as a nation, our leaders got used to just feeding off like pariahs on things they did not work for, they transferred that value to us 
as younger adults, and the younger adults have transferred it to their younger siblings because they all see the reward for doing nothing. And all our leaders lead, a lot of them, well, especially, you know, the ones that led, led us, I'm not necessarily talking about this particular set. It's been, how many years now? How old are we? Since 1960 that this has happened to us, or whenever they discovered 1966. So this culture of not being creative, this culture of not being able to convert mental an idea into something is what has destroyed us as a nation. So the creative industry is the only thing that can change this conversation because every single person that, is, that you see that is creative, be it a tailor, be it somebody who writes a book, be it a visual artist, be it a dancer, be it an actor, be it a producer, be it a director, be it a cinematographer, anybody who is able to create is the king. And those are the people that all of you need to become in this room. Did you want to add something? Uh, no. Okay. So I thank you very much for that, Bolanle. Um, I think one thing that came out of the conversation, aside again, we are reiterating the same. Th um, we're talking to the same point is financing. So I want to put this question to you, Chairman. How willing are banks, especially your bank? You speak to your bank to finance creative projects and businesses. Um, can you give us an example of a creative project or business that was financed by your bank and talk us through the process? Um, I think um, the first thing I want to say is we've actually had to have a rethink and a relook in our business at the creative industry. One, I think prior to this time, it's not been the most structured in terms of coming forward to say, this is the project. This is what it's about. This is how we're going to go about it. Not necessarily. I have to be honest. And maybe it's not that it's not structured. It's when you come forward. I've, before I worked in the bank, I worked in DSTV Multi-Choice. So I understand content. Yeah. And I understand the challenges that a lot of the, the people who came to Africa Magic had. Yeah. Um, I know the uh, uh, Bank of Industry, for instance, had put together some funds Funny and all, because yes. that's part of what they do. For us, it's two things. We would look at it from uh, sustainability a CSR type sustainability type project because it's not a business case in that sense. It is, is there a lesson to be learned? Is there an impact to come out? So how can we invest in this from that perspective? Okay. But it wouldn't be um, maybe not an investment to the kind of scale that maybe the producers would want, but it is let's start from that because then you can now pull it back to saying I'm educating, I'm driving female impact, I'm empowering in that sense. So that is one way we have decided to start looking at it, not as a business case in that sense, because it's the return on investment. It's now that you're now seeing ticket sales, this is happening, that is happening, so you're financing. But even that, I don't know if the numbers are as clear as they, used, as they should be yet, but I know, it, are they? Yeah. Verifiable. I don't want to tackle them, yeah. Verifiable. I don't to be tackled, so that some of them, yeah. Very I'm good. To be tackled. Fine. But... <laughs> Uh, now, yes. yes. So what we decided to look at it from is, okay, let's start from a sustainability project perspective and look at it from sustainability. Because if nothing else, the creative industry educates. It tells a story. It tells a story that can impact positively. It tells a story that can also um, uh, empower entrepreneurs. It can give jobs. It can give from that perspective. So how do you then invest from that perspective? I actually got... I know I got a proposal recently on that. Mm -hmm. And then look at it from, from that perspective. That's one. Mm -hmm. um, now you're telling me about what you're saying, which is looking at it from a business case and saying how much money and how then do you have a sharing um, um, uh, formula, yeah. exactly, to make some business case. Also, we've looked at it like um, for Diamond Bank now, the mobile app, we've actually gotten some very good uh, feedback on ticketing. Because the mobile app enables you to, yeah, so you can use that. So it's a platform for visibility. It's a platform for um, us to actually see, okay, what kind of monies are coming through. So that technology is enabling us to do that. So in partnerships now, we look at um, the few that we've tried to do is premieres. Oh, we want to sell tickets for X, Y, Z. Okay, so let's do that. But from a production perspective, no. So where we're looking at it, say, start up production would be from that sustainability project perspective. I'm speaking for my business because I know the Bank of Industry probably has a totally different platform yeah. for that. Okay. I was going to follow up with the question. I know you said sustainability, but if some 
intending producer was supposed to approach you guys, aside sustainability, you're speaking of structure, is there any other thing that you'll be looking at if someone is supposed to put a pro proposal to you in terms of um, producing either a play or a movie that will make you guys reconsider and say, you know what, we're going to put money behind it? I don't know. It's what Omotala kind of alluded to when she said there are proven numbers now of how much reach, one, how much money, is, two, can come in. So then that's what I said, that then you now go to the business case perspective and you say, this is the distribution. So the value chain of it, the distribution, how many people are actually buying it. I know that there, there were challenges in the past of piracy being in true control of the distribution of, of the product itself. But with more, I think they're like, they've added almost 100 more or more screens pan Nigeria where they actually do show these movies and they're actually returns on it. We didn't have that maybe a couple of years ago. That's why, like I said, the last time we reviewed this, which was about last year, middle of last year or so, we said, okay, we'd focus on it from a sustainability perspective. However, a more compelling case can be brought forward. Why not? Yeah. Thank you very much. So okay. Are you, are we, that we can, uh, we can review them. it. We review it. <laughs> because I say, so are we saying now that since you're on this panel, and this is a creative panel as well, mm -hmm. that we can re review it. Yes, it can be reviewed. Soonest. I'm challenging you and I'm holding you to that because Mrs. Austin Peters is here. She's doing stage. I know she's been doing Waka, the mo um, Fella uh, is current. Oh, the, was the, the current one is Fella, but before that one was Waka. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually talking about things that, because first and foremost, we need to ask, what does Diamond stand for? What is your goal? Because you know, the truth of matter is, when you come to uh, the entertainment industry, a bank called Bank of America single-handedly changed the fortune of Hollywood. If you go into the history, Hollywood was worse than Nollywood. It really was. It was Jankara kind of movies, you know, now they talk about oil in Nigerian industry. It was worse there, that one was worse than oil. That one was uh, kerosene, <laughs> you know. And oil means when you just bring out a movie and the next one or two weeks it goes right into like 15 era, you know, like the random market. But like I said earlier, now we have some kind of um, distribution network that is um, verifiable, you, you, the numbers are there, you can. Um, and our point is this, we need structured, um, um, partners who are going to come in and partner with the people who are doing great things like Mrs. Austin Pieces, like Moa Budu, like um, whoever. I'm building a film village in Badagri. Um, there's so many people who are, and women, sorry men, but <laughs> it's International Women's Day, I keep trying to remind you. Um, so here we're talking about women especially. And actually there is a, help me Charles, there is a, there is a, um, some kind of um, configuration or something like where they say women are the ones who actually return money or something like that when you borrow the money. What's that? Oh yeah. yes, there is okay. actually that. In the, when you borrow money, they always yeah, are more likely to. They are better. They are better. Yes. Rate, actually. And they are better. In, they, are better no? they are better bet to investing, mm. and um, they have a better savings culture, mm. and therefore are very. Ah, are, are you already know it now. So, so I know that, and that's why we drive the women thing. We yeah. do, and that's the reason why because. But it's not about. Um, um, what you also find that women borrow small, small, small because they're able to that manage their finances in that way. Yeah. So you now have to structure things and open up that, those kind of levels of loans and lending to them. So yes, mm -hmm. it's based on that insight. That so there's a young person that. right here now who's been listening to us and thinking, oh my God, the creative industry is a gold mine. Somewhere I can go in and they have these ideas. You know, they want to start something really astronomical, something different. Can they come to Diamond Bank? Is there a department that they can, that they can uh, reach, you know, that would, n that would understand peculiarly, you know, uh, the entertainment industry or the creative industry? Because the problem we have, or we've had in time past, is that when you go to the bank, they're used to other sectors. Yes. They're used to other sectors. Yes. The entertainment industry is very peculiar. It's different. Most of us are creatives. We don't understand figures that much. And I've, I've spoken to like two or three bank um, MDs or CEOs and, uh, who are friends. And I'm like, okay, you guys like us. You enjoy what we do. You like us. How about teaching us how this actually works? How about in every bank, there is a department that actually works with the creative um, industry? Where, for example, you, okay, we're coming to you to come get loans. And they say, okay, what is your um, financial backbone? What, what, you know, your cash flow? A lot of creatives, creative industry, like especially the smaller ones, don't have that. Because we are creative people. We, we think like we just want to go. We just, the passion comes and we want to flow. And most of us are not very structured. And that is how we can partner with people like you who are structured. And um, until you really love us enough to create a department that can help us grow, like you do with other, um, other 
um, job or sectors um, until you understand that and help us grow knowing fully well that this is, a, this is an industry that can make you billions and that can take your fortunes from whatever it is right now and um, triple it or, or quadruple it or whatever the case might be. Do we, uh, can we say to you that we need that kind of patience and that you can also tell us that you can go back to your company and talk to them about this? Because this is a major problem. It's actually a two-way street. So I agree with you. And it's something definitely I can speak for Diamond Band, we will and are considering. Yes, I can speak to that because we would look at it from an entrepreneurship perspective. And we're hot on that, so we have to really look at it again. So I can speak for Diamond Bank and say yes. But it's a two-way street. The same way you said not everybody's an actor. And some people should think about being agents. I had an interesting conversation with um, Femi Odugemi recently where he talked about, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, contract lawyers for contract legal people for, for the industry. And there are not that many who understand entertainment law and what have you. It's the same thing. So the same way some people are coming into the creative industry saying that I'm an actor or I want to be that, your strength may be from a financial perspective and being able to package that thing in a way that may not be perfect, but at least starts to appeal to the bank to understand it. So like I said, it's a two-way street. I am agreeing with you and I'm committing from our own perspective to say, yes, we have to relook at it and we are. But there also has to be from that end Yes, you're a creative, and I won't look to Amatala to do that, but there has to be somebody in that, in your production, yes, in that space, that is able to, if it's from a lawyer, the legal perspective, maybe that's it, it's a document, and just thinking through the process and sort of trying to develop some kind of story that justifies it, however big or however small. Because even when I was talking to Femi Odubemi, it was about um, a young person I'm mentoring who is a writer, and she wants to get her story to screen. And I wanted to understand how it works. And he said to me, he even said, I have to give you, uh, I can't remember the lady's name, but I know I've met her before, an entertainment lawyer, blah, blah. She can't access her because she's so busy. And there are not that many of, her, of people like her. And so this young girl wouldn't know where to go. She wouldn't know. But if you had maybe a few more of those kind of people as well, that can help put some kind of structure. So the structure is both ways. The structure is within us looking at it, and I think the entrepreneurship space, the small, medium you know, entrepreneurs, and, and even the big ones, that business is probably where that creative should sit. Yeah. One, then looking at the creative industry and saying, who there can understand, maybe not numbers to that extent, but can at least put together some kind of story. And it usually, unfortunately, comes from um, precedents. You have to have done it before. So if Bolani comes now, She's on, well, I know it's, it's, we didn't support you at the beginning. Well, if she comes now, I don't think you have, to, I'm, we did, but we did support you. But I'm just saying, if you maybe did not get as much as you would have thought or expected, if you come now with your success stories of Waka, X, Y, and Z, you know, it will be hard to get a leg in. Everybody else will be like, I oh, know that was an amazing, and we can see the numbers. So this, that's what I'm saying. So yes, so yes, they, yes. They, so how then do we put together some... Uh, there's a lady who was here before who said to the copper, youth copper, that uh, we do 250K. Uh, but you have to have some kind of parameters, some kind of measures, some, because the person may or may not succeed, so it's a gamble. You are proven, you have proven yourselves in your field, so you can come, or, you, or maybe that's what it is, with the backing of X, an Omotala, who says, I'm guaranteeing. Because this is my own history. This is the fact that I am either investing something in time or resources in this project would help. Maybe that's what it is. So you're now buying into the softer issues. It's not the hard currency. It's the fact that this person is being backed by there's a production team or advisor behind him or her that is sort of saying, look, this is a story that would go. Or then you start small. Yeah. I mean... Uh, okay. okay. You know why I brought this up? <laughs> when the same panel with me when we did the thing for... Um, Afrif. You remember that young man that came up and said, oh, and I asked the question and said, oh, he wanted to do um, pie, you okay. know, he wanted to do, okay, so and then remember, um, if you remember very well, and um, somebody in our panel said, oh, that's not going to work because it's very capital intensive. I remember I defended him and I said, that's not his problem. He has the ideas. We don't have such movies. He has the idea. He has a passion. Somebody needs to figure out how to get that out. And that's why I ask that question right now. Because there are so many young people who have great ideas. There are so many young people who know exactly what they could be doing. But they don't even know how to get it done. Because nobody's going to take a chance on them. But, you know, let me, let me step in. You know, the thing is, in Nigeria, again, I go back to this issue of creativity. Our banks, without um, direct attack at any one bank, the banks are not set up to develop people or talent. 
banks are supposed to return on investment for their customers and their shareholders at the end of the day. So it's not a bank's business. What they want to know is when you bring a business, are you bankable? Are you going to be able to return my money to me? So it's not, she's never going to be in a position where she will advise you and I that bring your ideas now. Now, for as long as we don't have statistics and we don't have infrastructure in the arts, nobody's going to bank us. Let's be honest. So what we need is you and I and a couple of people who have heart, who have spunk, who see the potential. Because like you said, in, in Hollywood, some people decided to invest. That must have been somebody who had a heart for arts. No, that's the point. Some people in there made that decision. In Nigeria, nobody is seeing it in the banking industry yet. So what we need is a point where somebody does the assessment and they say to themselves, the creative industry in Nigeria can generate 50 billion. What do they need to get there? They need cinemas, because really, you and I know that no matter how much, we spent close to about 300 million on 93 days. You will never make that money back because it's a game of numbers. If you don't have enough cinemas, you'll not make your returns. So therefore, no bank will loan me that money. So we went the route of grants because we recognized that we're not going to make that money back. So we didn't borrow a penny. We didn't borrow a penny to do 93 days. It was all foundation money. I did the math, like she was saying. Before we do any venture at Terraculture, because I have the background, we have a budget. We say, how many number of seats? How many tickets? Then, worst case scenario, 50% occupancy, that we say to ourselves, let's do it. That we cap the expense. Most artists are not capable of doing that. So my next movie, what did we do? We did the math. Boom. How many legs, um, how many footfall in every cinema? Minimum level, maximum 50%. We shouldn't, sell, we shouldn't spend more than XYZ amount. If you spend 40 million, you'll make your money back. If you spend more than that, you begin to go on a loss. Most artists are not able to do that. So what we need is a banker or a group of bankers. There's something called arts and business in Europe. And there was in America. And there was a time that Tai Adenoku of GT Bank, I approached him, and the Ford Foundation funded us. So we should be talking to foundations. Funded me to go around, and we saw the model all over the world. There's an arts and business council that annually will come together and put money into a pot and say, okay, her movie will probably make X, Y, Z, let's give her money. And then this is what we need to make sure that we make that money back. So they will invest in the cinemas. They will make sure that there's a cinema in Uyo, Abba, blah, blah, blah. They will ensure that there's marketing. They will ensure that there is all the things that you and I have to do ourselves. But at the moment, we don't have people with that heart. And we don't have people with that spunk that control the finances of Nigeria. And it's because they're myopic. They're myopic and they're not investing in the future. That's the only reason. Thank you very much. But one much. day okay. it will change. One day yeah. it will change. Because everybody's beginning to realize that we're hurting ourselves. Yeah. We think that we're smart, but we're actually hurting ourselves. Because if we were to create enough cinemas, then your movie will clock one billion naira. Yeah. You'll not be calling on Wakanda, Wakanda, making noise about Wakanda. Yes, because I spoke once to the French Consul General, and he said, Nigeria is the one country that does not need to market anybody internationally. You have the numbers. If Nigeria focuses on just the Nigerian population and West Africa, and everybody's doing um, each movie, everybody pays a dollar to see the movie, you'll make your money back. You're 100 and what, how many are we? 140. Slash it by half. Million. Slash it by half, 75 million people. By the time you're all paying XYZ, we know how much returns you'll make. So if you spend XYZ, you already make your money back. But they're not seeing it, but we will get there. Yes. We will champion them, we will teach them. Yes, please. <laughs> A wonderful round of applause for Mrs. Austin Peters. I guess it, it also ties to what you're saying when people rely on black gold, that's oil, as against looking at the industry and seeing how they can build it to the extent that, you know what, if we turn it around, it will be, it will be making more, much more revenue. Okay. So, we had wedding party. They yeah. made X, Y, Z numbers. I don't know how much, but yeah. in reality, whatever was put in there, they made more, right? And if you look at the footfall, that's not even one third of Nigeria's population. Yeah. And that's because we, ha we don't even have enough cinemas no, around don't. Nigeria. Yeah. Now, one theater, this theater, one production, Fela and the yes. Kalakuta Queens. Yeah. The amount that we put into it, we tripled it. 
in 12 days. Oh, wow. 12 days in this yeah. one space. Yeah. Now, imagine if you had 10 theaters and you move this play it. around. Yes. Or if you were doing the same Fela and the Kalakuta Queens 365 days of a year, imagine how much you would make. It's, it's simple math, but they don't see it. Thank you very much. Um, but let me just get to my question, my final question to you guys, which was, um, so social media and blogging is basically a, a successful creative industry right now. Um, how have you used this in this um, platform? How successful has it been for you individually or collectively or during your, for your business? And then how would you encourage young and upcoming women or men on how to use social media effectively. So there's those that stock fashion designers. So I started with that. And we are in about six, um, um, six stores in Nigeria, Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt. Um, and, but then we do our direct sales online. So we have our website and we have our Instagram. And Instagram has been phenomenal. You know, we do our product shots. We get our detailing and, you know, we present that to to our customers. However, I found that women are misusing Instagram. They are using it to sell their markets, not their market, okay. <laughs> if you know what I'm trying to say. You know, which is quite disappointing because you have this great platform that you can use to sell anything. You can use to create a business, you can use to expand, you can use to reach these millions of people, but then you put your breast, you put your bum, you put your hair, you put your, your you know, I mean, and even your captions are not selling, it's not selling anything. It's not even, you're not even, even if you want to create a brand presence, fine, but you're not, you're not targeting um, your market. You're not, some people don't even look at their insights to see, oh, do I have the percentage of male or female following me? Or, you know, what was this reach like so I can know what to do next time? I think, so what for me, for my business, it's been fantastic. For my personal brand, it's been awesome. But then I want to encourage women to do more with the platform that has been given to us for free. I think for Motala, I would just say, in terms of your advocacy as well as your philanthropy, how has the platform been for your own? I don't think there's much to add to what she said already. She said most of it. Um, what do you use your platform for? And how do you use it? And what is your purpose? I think that's what I always ask. Even my kids, um, I remember there was a time when someone was saying, oh, kids shouldn't be on Instagram. I'm like, hello, is the 21st century. What you need to ask is, why are they there? who monitors them, and where is their mind at? My kids are on Instagram. My son has been on, my last son has been on Instagram for like four years or so, you know, and you would think that's young. But if you go on my son's Instagram page, and quite honestly, he only posts about um, football and cameras, which is what he's interested in, um, and all of that stuff. I monitor him. I try to, I mean, you can't monitor. It, look, if he was not on Instagram, if he wanted to go on internet, he would go on internet anyway. Do you get my point? But how do you teach people from a very young age or at whatever age to know what the, what the um, um, network, or sorry, internet is for? Where is your mind at? How do you train yourself? Because when someone gives you something, you can either hang yourself with it or you can save yourself with it. Um, it depends on how you use it. The same way they will say, oh, you can use a knife to cut yam and eat uh, boiled yam or you can use it to kill someone. Right? So when internet came, how did you perceive what it was for? Um, even today, how do you, over the years as things have evolved and all of that, how do you still perceive it? Um, like a mommy said, you have all this, um, you have this reach, you have this amount of um, people coming on this one app. And um, if all you think about is to showcase yourself, then you better be making money from yourself. I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> if that's what you do for a living, good luck. <laughs> but if that's not what you do for a living, you better start thinking about um, what you do for a living and how you can project that. I spoke to a very wonderful friend of mine yesterday about opening up their social media. I don't understand why some of you put your social media on private. Why are you even on social media? 
you can use WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, why you, it's called social media for a reason. If you don't want to open up your social media so that people can find you and find what the essence of you is, leave social media. Don't be there. Don't, don't torture yourself. It's torture. That thing is very hard to maintain. No? So why take on a burden if it's not getting you money? Because I know a lot of people that have made money from social media. A lot of millionaires, billionaires, if you may. A lot of stars. If, in fact, um, I say in the past three years or so, most of the comedians we know today were all made from social media. What are you doing? What are you doing with your time? Why you go on social media and waste that data, your money or whatever, to go and say, hey, what's up? If I catch my child doing just what's up? Oh, dear. You, you must be selling something. I must know you about something. There must, some, there must be something. Or if you are not selling anything right now, start grooming yourself to sell something. Start letting people know. Even the process of um, preparing people's mind to receive you is something. Prepare their mind to, to, to receive you when you finish school. Prepare their mind. Let them begin to... It's called following for a reason. Let them follow you for a reason. Where are you? Why are they following you? You are happy that you have followers to where? Where are you taking them to? To hell? Where, where are they following you to? You know, I mean, you know, what, are they, what are they getting from you? What are, what are they going to... If you don't monetize that, then you're silly. You really are, because people are monetizing and making a lot of money um, from social media. Like you said, check your insights, check people who follow you. Insights means you're checking, okay, if you, it, most of your followers are male or female. Just in case you don't know, it's up there somewhere. Press it, insights. Yeah, it has those line, line, line things. You know, you check it, you know people are following you. Um, that's if you have a business. Um, why they are following you when you post something, what posts do better, you know, stuff. So you can weigh your options and know what you need to post more, what times you need to post, and stuff like that. So you can maximize um, the use of that app. Um, having said that, I think um, to round all of that up, um, really social media or whatever it is that um, allows people to get to you is just so that at the end of the day you can be marketed so always remember that and ask yourself what am i uh, marketing so i just wanted to add to that you know um i, I think you, um you, i was thinking about it and you, you, on my own personal instagram it, you know it was a little bit difficult thinking about what i wanted to to market or what i wanted because i know that a lot of people here may not have businesses that they want to be on Instagram or your business may not be the type of business that you sell on Instagram, I don't know. But generally, we all have personal accounts. Now, you can think about things, educate. People always want to, want to be educated on Instagram, so put a quote that is educating somebody on something you know. Health. People always want to know something about health. You know something about your skin that you haven't that you haven't shared with somebody before. Maybe you use this particular kind of black soap that your mother did. Share it. Um, um, fitness, you, you realize that, oh, if you plank a lot, it would really share that. So there's particular things that you can look at on, you know, um, particularly um, targets or roles or, or topics yeah. that you can bring up and just list them out and always try to post something in that direction. So for you, Chioma, as in because you're a corporate brand, and I know most of the corporate brands are trying to sell products and services, but how do you encourage people to even use it effectively? Um, well, for us, like you said, it's products or services. We try to not be about selling the product so much as sharing the impact. So it's sharing the impact of, I use a, a classic one on, on all our platforms on, on Twitter. We have a help handle and we have a regular handle. The regular handle, inspiring words, sharing something fresh we've done, and the help handle, is that's all it's about, help. How can we help you? Inquiries, abuse, anything that comes through, it's, it's usually directed there so that we can find what the problem is, what have we done right, what have we done wrong, how can we support you? Facebook, same thing. Facebook for us is just sharing where we're going to be next, where's the opportunity for you, um, we are having an event, we are here, I would post it that we're here, that kind of stuff. So I think when, Amo, um, when Amotola said, have a purpose, it's, it's even for the business, it's what's your purpose across all platforms. The reason why we are on social media is because we recognize that a lot of people want a mobile, so social media for them is on their mobile phones, they are going up and down. You will reach a huge demographic there and you just need to be present there. But it's important, and you would never find, and in, I use my own corporate business, never find us attacking or responding to attacks. That's not the space for that. Um, take it offline. Especially, it's, even if it's not a customer, 
even if it's um, even if it's somebody who is just upset at something that they've observed with your brand or so take it up, engage but it's important to follow through engage and even if you don't solve the problem but at least you engage and give the person some hope that this is what's going on so for a corporate business it's, it's really important to to follow through on every single engagement as much as possible but our purpose is to be visible our purpose is to share impact our purpose is to drive awareness of whatever service, opportunity, well, want to wish you well for the day, want to give advice. We, we try to have nice funny quotes on Fridays and on Mondays just to get people going and people normally respond to us or at least share something back at all. So it's also an interactive platform because that's also another way you find out what's going on. Um, there are incidences we've heard about just because somebody posted, did you know that we went to this branch and we did this here and this is what happened? And we may not have gotten the feedback from the branch or whichever um, officer was handling that case. And that's what we find out. So it's great for us. It's good and bad, but ultimately we choose to see it as good. Because if you didn't have that opportunity, not everybody can walk into a branch. Not everybody has someone's phone number. Not everybody can reach your call center. So it's an opportunity for us. Personally, I mean, for me, social media is... I, I troll people on Instagram anyway, personally. I just troll. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people do that as well. And my Instagram is private, personally, just because um, I have a huge family, and that's just my way of just keeping in touch with them. So my Facebook and my Instagram are private to us uh, because that's what... But I've started opening up to... I get, I, get, I, get invite, I get people wanting to be a part of that, and I find that the other young people I've met here who found me there, I'm like, oh, okay. I just remember, oh, I know that face. And I just open it up and I'm like, okay, sure, fine, whatever. So what that actually has now made me consciously do is um, um, look for inspiring things to do on that platform. It's either I'm pushing something from Diamond Bank or if I'm pushing something from my own personal space, it's something that I know would impact positively or make someone feel happier, you know, for what it's worth. Thank you very much. Polanle, do you want to add <laughs> We, we do social media simply, like she said, purpose. Why? We do it because that's the easiest way for us to reach a wider audience. Um, personally, I don't like it. I've never been a social person. I hate to be followed. I hate to follow. So, but they worked on me for five years and said, listen, people need to know your face. You know, you have terror culture. Everybody knows terror culture. They don't know you. I say, it's okay. Leave me like that. That's why I've got to be a director and a producer. But interestingly, the minute I started putting up my face, I realized that it sells your brand more. So those that are talking, they know what they're saying. So it's not always about what you like or hate. If you want to make money, you have to do certain things that make you uncomfortable. So when people come to me and say, hello, you're buying me, I'm like, what does he want? I don't want to say hello to nobody. But you're like, hey, hello because now the face is out there. For 10 years, I was living in peace, and I loved it. So you do what you have to do to make the money that you have to make and to promote the brand that you have to promote. That's the reality. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give the panelists a healthy round of applause.